Follow in the Tiger Man's Footsteps by Colin Guest. Chapter 3, Saudi Arabia. On arriving back at Jeddah Airport the following week, Harold was waiting to meet me. By the time we arrived on the site, it was lunchtime, so Harold took me straight into the canteen. Two English guys were having lunch, and one looked up and greeted me with a query. Do you have my passport? No, my driver has it. He's driving my car down from Riyadh. He said I should have brought it. I jokingly said, don't worry. He can only lose it. He went crazy. Without any warning, he jumped up, sending his chair crashing to the floor. The next minute, I felt the cold touch of the end of a spoon pressed tight against my throat. With flared nostrils and eyes blazing, he screamed, don't even joke about it. I went icy cold with fright. I thought he would rip my throat out. After what seemed like a lifetime, he removed the spoon from my throat and stomped out of the canteen. I stood there in total shock. From the surprised look on Harold's face, this amazing incident shocked him as much as it did me. A few hours later, my driver arrived with the car and I asked if he'd brought a passport with him. He took it out of his pocket and handed it to me and I gave it to Harold to hand to the man. The next day, the man came and apologized. Sorry about the other day, but I've been here six months without a break. I need one before I go crazy. My being in Saudi Arabia and the port city of Jeddah started in 1983, when due to a serious back problem, I lost my job in the UK. By the time I had recovered, my wife and I had used up all our savings. To put it mildly, we found ourselves in a serious financial situation. I decided the best way for us to get back on our feet would be for me to get a job overseas, as having already worked overseas twice, I knew I could earn far more money than in the UK. Once fully fit, I sent my CV to a company that carried out overseas contracts. To my delight, two weeks later, I received a letter informing me that I had an appointment to see the overseas managing director. This was great news. I was also excited at seeing the company required someone re a position in Saudi Arabia. A few days later, my wife received a phone call from a man asking to speak to me. She explained I would not be home until later. The man asked, is that Jen? She said, yes. Hi, Jen, it's Arnie. My wife knew Arnie from years ago when he and I worked for the same company. Oh, hi, Arnie. How and where are you? I'm in Saudi Arabia. No, tell me the truth, Arnie, where are you? Honestly, Jen, I'm in Saudi Arabia. Well, that's a coincidence. Colin just received a letter, re, an interview about a job in Saudi. Yes, I know, that's why I'm calling. The person Colin will be seeing is my boss, and I want to tell him what salary he should ask for when they meet. Later, I was amazed when he told me the figure. Never in my wildest dreams had I imagined I would be able to earn that kind of money. During an interview in London the following week, I met Ian, my future boss, who explained everything about the position, including salary, which was as Arnie had suggested. After a good discussion and a general chat, I accepted a one-year renewable contract. The position was as project supervisor, based in Riyadh. When Ian told me I would be working on a palace for the royal family, I was delighted. I had never worked on one, so it was with much apprehension I later boarded a plane to Riyadh. By going there, I would earn far more money than I had ever earned, enabling us to get back on a secure financial footing. However, on the downside, I would not see my family for six months, being when I would be due two weeks leave. Although not happy about this part of my contract, I had to grin and put up with it. In life, you can never have all you want, as sometimes there are sacrifices to be made along the way. On my arrival at Riyadh Airport, I was pleased to find Arnie waiting to meet me. Although he looked the same as when I saw him some four years ago, instead of wearing trousers and an open-necked shirt, he wore a suit and tie. He gave me a firm handshake and a warm embrace as his brown eyes twinkled with delight. Hi, Carl, you're looking good. It's great to see you after all these years. You too, I exclaimed. You're looking very smart. Arnie laughed, saying, yes, in my job I have to be. As we walked out to where he had parked his car, the heat hit me, and sweat immediately broke out on my back. I mentioned this to Arnie. He laughed. You'll soon get used to it. He explained that he'd been in Saudi since leaving our old company four years ago. 
if I'd known earlier you were here and I could have been earning a salary like I'm on now, I would have been out here like a shot. Sorry, Call, but after you left Benbo's, I never knew where you lived, so couldn't contact you. Arnie's car was a new-looking Toyota. As I climbed in, I laughed. Well, this is certainly better than the old Morris who used to drive in England. He laughed. You'll find everything here is better than in England. As he drove out from the car park, he explained I would be sharing an apartment with him and another couple of our guys. On the ride into town, I noticed the roads were wide and well-lit, with modern buildings lining the streets. From first impressions, I thought Riyadh looked like a prosperous city. For sure it was a big improvement on either Iran or Qatar. Thirty minutes later, Arnie turned off the road and parked in a large underground car park. We rode an elevator up to the company apartment, where Arnie knocked as he unlocked the door and introduced me to Mike and Mac, two colleagues I would be sharing the apartment with. Due to feeling tired from all my traveling, after a brief chat, I turned in for the night. The next morning, a driver came to take me to head office of our Saudi partner. Here I was introduced to everyone and made to feel welcome. Ian, my new boss, told me there had been a change of plans. The palace had informed him that as they did not know me, they wanted Arnie, who they knew from previous projects, to be the project manager. Although disappointed, I could understand their concerns. Instead, Ian said, I would be in charge of refitting out works at the Hyatt Hotel in Riyadh. A short time later, Ian and Arnie took me to the hotel, where I was introduced to Sa'ard. Ian explained he was our Thai supervisor in charge of our Thai and Filipino workers. He was pleased when Sa'ard, who could speak broken English, shook my hand, welcoming me to the site. Ian gave me a tour, explaining what works had to be carried in the various sections. One area was the main lobby, which had a high ceiling. Here, Ian said, Due to the hotel remaining open during our works, we need to install scaffolding so we can work overhead while the hotel guests walk safely underneath. I will arrange for a specialist scaffolding company to visit the site and discuss our requirements. A few days after doing so, they delivered and erected the scaffold. They also provided enough scaffolding boards for our men to install, which I instructed Zahar to have taken up to deck out the scaffolding. However, when later checking, I was annoyed to see only a few boards placed on top of the scaffold. Even more astonishing, some of our ties were walking around on them. What's going on, Sard? I said, pointing up at the scaffolding. Why have you not done as I asked? His big round face lit up with a smile as he replied, It's okay, Mr. Khan. We are used to working on scaffolding like this. You might be, I replied. However, I have to go up there as well. Get it fully decked out, as I won't be going up there until it is. After laughing at my obvious discomfort, he gave orders for the boards to be taken up and laid out to cover the scaffolding. As I had never worked with foreign workers before, I was dubious as to their capabilities. However, to my surprise, I found the work they did was of high quality. Once I knew my way around Riyadh, the company issued me with a Mazda 323 car. Although small, I was relieved to find it had air conditioning fitted as standard. With the temperature being around 40 degrees, this made driving comfortable. Traveling to the office one day, I noticed deep trenches being dug alongside the roads in several areas. Arnie informed me they were storm drains. These were necessary, as although Riyadh was in the middle of the desert, there were periods of heavy rainfall, which sometimes resulted in major flooding in some areas. Another thing I noticed was rows of empty high-rise apartment blocks. Arnie said the king had built them to accommodate Bedouins, who had no permanent homes. However, they had rejected living in them, as they much preferred their traditional lifestyle, which they had enjoyed for many years. As the roads in Riyadh were wide and in good condition, cars were driven at high speed. However, I observed with some surprise, speeding cars slowed to allow women wearing national dress to cross a busy dual carriageway. This, Arnie said, was normal. In Saudi Arabia, if you are found guilty of causing the death of someone, you can pay what is known as blood money. If this is acceptable to the relatives of the deceased, you pay them a sum of money in lieu of going to prison. Walking around the shops in Riyadh one Friday, I noticed several men carrying large wooden sticks. Although puzzled as to why, I soon found out when the muezzin in the mosques called out at prayer time. On seeing some of the shopkeepers had not covered the goods outside their shops, 
the men used the sticks to turn everything upside down. These men ensured that when the call to prayers went out, all shops closed. Not only that, any goods on display outside had to be covered. It really was an amazing experience to watch the men in action with their sticks. A humorous incident occurred one night on the way home to our apartment. At the time, I was in Max Mazda along with a couple of other guys, following Ian in his large American car. While waiting behind Ian's car for a set of traffic lights to change, Mac thought he would play a joke on Ian. He slowly drove his car up against Ian's and nudged it forward. As quick as a flash, Ian responded, putting his car in reverse with screaming tires. He started to push our car backwards. Mac panicked and jumped out of the car in alarm, and Ian stopped pushing our car. He got out of his car and laughed as Mac, embarrassed by his action, hung his head and climbed back behind the wheel of our car. Ian bent down to Mac's open window. Laughing loudly, he said, next time you decide to play a trick like that, make sure you're driving the bigger car. At the office one day, I noticed all the office staff, including the managing director, go downstairs to pray. The prayers were led by the chief accountant. Arnie told me this was an everyday occurrence and one quite normal in Saudi Arabia. I felt disturbed that one of our project managers had been arrested and put in jail, having been caught going through a set of traffic lights on red. Inquiring about this apparent harsh treatment, I was shocked when Arnie informed me that this was quite normal. He said, if the police see anyone commit this offense, they stop the car with the driver taken straight to jail for three days with the driver given no opportunity to contact anyone to tell of their plight. So make sure you don't get caught doing this. Due to this, and the fact some traffic lights were so high up off the ground they could not be easily seen, it caused me concern when driving around town. However, I experienced no problems while driving in Saudi Arabia. After working on the Hyatt project for several weeks, Ian asked me to call in at head office. A problem had arisen with Harold, one of our project managers, who was looking after a royal villa in Jeddah and a palace-type contract on the outside of Jeddah. Due to this problem, he wanted me to take over the royal villa project. A few days later, Arnie and I flew down to Jeddah in business class, so we're at the front of the plane when it landed, which I thought was good. However, no sooner had the plane's door been opened, I felt an enormous blast of hot air hit me, as though I had taken a shower with all my clothes on. To my amazement, Arnie, although wearing a suit and tie, seemed unaffected by the heat. I exclaimed, boy, that sure is some heat. Arnie laughed, don't worry. Although it's much hotter here than in Riyadh, you'll soon get used to it. At the time, there were no direct walkways from the planes, so we stepped out of the plane into a special high-level bus. Reaching the arrivals entrance, the body of the bus lowered itself to ground level on telescopic legs. To me, this was like one scene in a space film. We stepped out of the bus and entered the arrivals hall, which I was amazed to find enormous. Arnie informed me that it was the second largest airport in the world, with Riyadh the largest. We had no luggage, so passed straight through customs. On stepping into the bright sunshine, it felt as though the air was being sucked out of my lungs. However, to my relief, we were able to climb straight into one of the waiting air-conditioned taxis. Arnie gave the driver directions to the villa, and we set off. On the way, I noticed Jeddah was much more western-oriented than Riyadh, with the streets lined with numerous well-known branded shops. Twenty minutes later, we turned down to what Arnie said was the Corniche. This consisted of a wide dual carriageway running alongside the edge of the Red Sea. On the various roundabouts we passed, I was astonished to see huge monuments on them. One, an enormous bicycle, stood at least 30 feet tall. Another was a massive rocket-shaped structure, with another a large globe of the world. It was an amazing sight. I'd never seen anything as startling. A short time after turning off the Corniche, we drove down a narrow road to where the villa was under construction. This proved to be less than a hundred yards from the sandy shore of the sparkling Red Sea. As we climbed out of the taxi, I was surprised at how salty the air was. Even had we arrived at night, I would have immediately known we were next to the sea. We met up with Harold during a long meeting with him and the chief engineer. Both became angry. So much so, it ended with them shouting and screaming with noses just a few inches apart. I was shocked at witnessing such a scene and thought it would come to blows. 
Fortunately, Arnie managed to defuse the situation. After calming Harold down, the three of us went for a walk around the site. I could see why Ian had to remove Harold from the project. It was obvious he and the site engineer did not get on. After a good chat with Harold while he took Arnie and me around the site, we returned to the airport, where I was shocked when informed there were no available seats back to Riyadh until the next day. With a knowing smile, Arnie said, No problem. I have a friend here who will soon sort this out for us. As Arnie walked away, I was left wondering where we would stay the night. I need not have worried, for on his return, Arnie wore a big smile. No problem, he said. Our plane leaves in one hour. Like the old saying, it's not what you know, it's the people you know. <laughs>